Uh, okay, so I have some serious stuff and I have some little bit of jokes. I hope you'll be serious and the serious stuff and uh, laugh at the jokes and not the other way around. <laughs> That's kind of the serious stuff. Right? Right, uh, so let's, might, let's start. You might need to move the microphone a little closer. I see. Yeah, is that better? Yep. Yeah. All right, thank you. So I have some people I know, I'll try not to look at you because the biggest challenge here is to you know, make this talk. You know, we give talks to people in our community and we know the language that we share, but uh, that makes it way difficult and incomprehensible than anybody else. So I'm trying to see how far I can go. Let's start. and say, okay, this guy is going to live maybe another 25 years, on average. That's one number, that's not really quantifying uncertainty. So maybe we can look at the data a little bit more carefully and say, okay, probability of living beyond 30 years, say, is 0.4, 40%. And what that means is, all the people like me in the past, 40% of them live 30%, 30 years or more. So that's, you know, that's the attempt. You get these probability distributions, so that's what we are trying to do with uncertainty. uncertainty. We cannot predict when the event is going to happen, when a person is going to die, for example. But we can kind of say, okay, what's the chance that the person will die between 70 to 80 years, within the next five years, live beyond 100 years, so on and so forth. So that's one focus. We're going to try and model uncertainty. And we model uncertainty through these uh, 
probably probabilities. That's how historically you know, things have evolved. Now, the focus of this talk is actually going to be on the tales of modeling uncertainty. So I mentioned to you probability of living beyond 100 years. Now that's a tale event. It's very unlikely. And for most people it's not really that important how long uh, if I live more than 100 years. So it's not an important tale event unless you know, it's a pension manager in government and then they'll have to worry about these things. Uh, but the other tale event, you know, probability that somebody like me would die in the next five years could probably be of great importance to me. So tail events which have small probabilities but are consequential, with catastrophic consequences, like earthquakes, those are the kind of things that we're going to be worrying about. Yeah. So, that's, I know. so that's the focus on the talk. And the big picture is that there are two big probability distributions that arise in nature, that people have studied the, over time, nature and social behavior. And the purpose of this talk is to bring those distributions uh, uh, to life. Throw some light on where they occur, why they occur, such, like, such things. Now, about the, what we just saw in the beginning. So, you know, what we saw was that the probability started in the 17th century. Now, we've had mathematicians who've been, you know, very strong mathematicians in the Greek times, in the Egyptian times, in the Arab world, in India, in China, for much up till 17th century. So, what, what took so long to come up with probability? To a theory of modeling probability? Can anybody speculate on this? Uh, I mean, why would the Greeks, why did they miss it? So the big answer is that, you know, we are generally governed by religious thoughts. You know, we believe that future is preordained. <laughs> so, you know, you don't really expect to, you don't really feel the need to get a modern future. You're scared of future, that's all. But during the Renaissance, so 17th century is Renaissance, when there's a new confidence in people. So they view the future a bit differently. So that's kind of, you know, that's one rationale for why probability theory picked up at that time because there were people who were willing to explore and try new things. Uh, now, in this particular case, you know, Pascal and Fermat, you know, Fermat you might know from Fermat's uh, famous theorem, uh, but Pascal and Fermat had this communication between them and they had a very precise gambling problem posed to them. Now, that helps science a lot, to have a precise problem to work on, to think about. So, you know, then you know what you're working with. That gave a lot of clarity to what they did. This problem was about 200 years old. I will not talk about the problem. That's not going to be the focus of this talk. But that's the story behind probability. So anything else I want to say? Uh, many of the slides that I made actually, I've, I've got a lot of help from my PhD student Sarath here. He's done a wonderful job. Can you just uh, give a round of applause? He's uh, also helping me out right now. So what we'll do for you, uh, you know, one thing is, uh, I'll we'll just send some chits to you. On the chit, you don't have to write your age. Uh, just write your birth date, your month and birth date, and your name if you want, you can have a coded name, that's fine. But can you, so the chits will be, you know, so we'll go around and then can you just send them back to Sarah? Okay. Thank you, so we'll, we'll start the chat now. So this session is, you know, I, I, this is a little bit, it's not just information going this way, I also have to, I should tell you something about myself, so this is my journey to the value of stability. So I, I'm defining stability, you can call it happiness, uh, but the point is, going down is good, going up is bad. I mean, the way I'm thinking about this is one is moving around randomly, and then the gravity is pulling you down. So you want to go as further down as you want. That's going to be the story of my life. So you can see now. So born and raised in Delhi. Uh, and then uh, I do a bit of a random walk. Random walk just means that you flip a coin and decide where you want to go next. <laughs> So a bit of a random walk, and then I can grow up a little bit. Oh, sorry. So when I completed my P-Tech, that was also in Delhi, in IIT Delhi. And the only remarkable thing that I want to mention here is that I was like any other B-Tech in IIT, you know, who doesn't quite know what they want to do and why they got into IIT. It's just something that people do. But I met, uh, you know, very inspirational teacher in my fourth year, third, third year, I think. Uh, some of you might know, Kiran said, he fits into this setting because, you know, he started Spick McKay, he sustained Spick McKay, it's a society for promotion of Indian culture and arts. Uh, and a very inspirational person, he works in operations research, applying mathematics. So that's why I finally got a little bit serious on the subject of mathematics, applying mathematics, and then I went on to do a PhD. Alright, and uh, then uh, many years later, four years later, I completed my PhD. So, PhD from where? From Stanford. Uh, but if, yeah, 
let's make this in any question you have be nice. Uh, the noteworthy thing in this was how easy the PNG was for me, you know, in the sense how much enjoyable it was. So, you know, I took summer internships with some people who had just completed their PNG, so they had research problems to ready. You just took pictures on the board. And then you know you make a picture on a board and then you spend days and days of looking at the picture. Not moving very much, playing around a little bit, and after a while things begin to make sense. So it was a nice experience. And I mentioned that I was kind of you know inspired to uh, do a PhD, but you know, I don't get inspired too much that easily. So I carried on with my design to go to the real world. So I first went to an off Wall Street company. I was in the US in Baltimore for two years. My family was in Washington DC that time. And then when I came back to India, I was in management consulting firm. So the random work was continuing. I was exploring to see what works for me. Uh, and thereafter, I joined, I returned back to academia. Uh, so few points here. So, you know, I think there's a temperament issue going on. So if you are highly energetic, uh, if you enjoy managing relationships, spending a lot of time making relations and all that, then, uh, you know, in corporate law, too involved long hours and uh, meeting deadlines. If you like that kind of thing, then it's for you. And you know, later on, you become a leader in some sense. But if you like to kind of live a relaxed pace, think about things. You know, so the, 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 the analogy is that you know, in my corporate days, they'll say, "Hurry up, we have to get this out. Don't think too much." And now I tell my students, you know. Go back, yeah, go back, spend another month, think about this, you really need to understand this. That's somewhat a different, of course I was like biased here. Uh, but that's been my, you know, my uh, uh, journey, so retired to academia as I say, because I've been in academia now for 18 years now, I don't think of this as work at all. It's an extreme detail. You know, we, work, we spend more time at it, but it's just such an enjoyable experience. Uh, you can see that that's a cartoon, it's not really me. The black hair is not there, the moustache is wrong. And I, I usually have different kind of glass when I have chemicals in my hand. All right. Uh, okay. So now we we'll move on to the, you know, the big picture of this talk today. So the big picture is that for the last two centuries, many natural and social phenomena have been thought to have a probability distribution that I mentioned you earlier, which is bell curve. I'll explain that in the next slide what bell curve means. And I'll explain what phenomena. The, what I have in mind is height of people, IT of people, such things. And lately, particularly in social settings, one sees fat tail distributions. So the intuition for these things I just as you go along, but you know, bell curve distributions are distributions which are random, but it's not too random. They're mildly random, not very noisy. While fat tail distributions are that you have some uh, uh, many, many gods and few giants. So lately one sees that a lot. And I'll kind of explain why one sees these things. So that's the agenda for today. And what I do is I'll describe this distribution and shed some light on underlying principles. Because there's some simple underlying scientific principles to determine why you see power one or why you see two. So that's kind of the agenda for today. Any, uh, I assume a lot of people amongst you have not heard of Bell curves. Is that fair to say? Or? Few people have not heard of that. So the big idea of bell curve, as I said, is not too much randomness. So suppose we take a random person's height, and this data I got from uh, probably from the US now. So the people are a little bit taller. So a random man or a woman would have an average height of 5 feet and 7 inches. It's kind of illustrated, it may not be extremely accurate. But the point is that it's not very noisy. So if you say, how many people are taller than 5 feet and 10 inches? So 1 in 6. 1 in 6 is that much taller. How many are taller than you know, 6 feet and 2 inches? 1 in 44, not too many. And then you'll rarely see somebody who's 8 feet tall. Does anybody know the record of the tallest person ever in the world? You know? 8 feet 11 inches. Oh, yeah. Robert Bangor? Probably, yeah. The high probability. <laughs> but uh, uh, he passed away when he was 22. But right now, the current person is 8 feet 1 inches. Uh, so the point is, it's not even double the average. And what does bell curve mean in this setting? So the distribution, how these uh, proportions are distributed, 
can be explained by a bend curve there. It's bend shape. Uh, this is the curve that was discovered by, as I mentioned, Gauss and Laplace. And I'll explain the significance of this curve because it's found everywhere and for very good reasons. And it's used a great deal in statistics. Uh, so you can see that in the last uh, 67 inches is the mean, that's 5 feet 7 inches. And what this curve is saying is that the area below this curve is equal to 1. That's the total probability. And if you see between 64 and 70, how much area comes in, that comes up to be 0 0.68, 68% 60 of the area. So what that is saying is that 68% of people, their heights are between 64 inches and 70 inches. So that's, so proportions are being captured by this curve. This curve is giving you information about proportions. So you can see how many people are between 70 and 75, that's just the area around here. What you can see also is that the numbers become very low once you go to 80, 85 inches. And that's kind of capturing the fact that you don't see people who are more than 8 feet tall or 9 feet tall. Similarly on this side. So this is an example of bell curve. Any questions on this? Uh, so again, the point of this is that it's a nice curve. Uh, tails are very little. Tail probabilities, tail proportions. So probability is coming because I'm picking a random person, person at random. Every person in the world is equally likely. I pick a person at random, what's his height or her height. So that's how probability is coming in. All right, so this is like the distribution. Now let's talk about random person's income when it follows a fat tail distribution. So I'm describing the other concept now. Uh, and I'll give you an example of salaries. So you can see that the average European person's salary is 18,000 euros. Right? And then look at the variability. Higher than 1 million euros, 1 in 62.5. 1 billion is significantly more than 18,000. Well, let's just go back to uh, the height example. 5 feet 7 was the average and nobody was twice that much. And in income, you see a dramatic kind of uh, difference. Even if you go to 32 million, one in 64,000. So lots of millionaires in, in UK. In UK, you have 70, 80 million people. So lots of millionaires there, and similarly all over Europe. And you even have people who are, uh, who have sell, you know, who have, whose average salary is more than 320 million. So that's an example of fat day distribution. Uh, so let me just illustrate this pictorially. So these are some people who are the tail end of the fat day. Carlo, Sin, Slim, uh, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, this person you probably know. Uh, this is the distribution which is giving us proportion in this case. So again, the overall area below this is 1. Proportion of people which have small income is given by this area. So large number of people are small. And then area here is quite substantial, it's fat tail. Much, much more than what you would have had in the bell curve setting. So these are people, uh, you know, this is few people here, more than you would, you would have there, who are earning massive amounts. So that's the idea. You know, if you look at, if you collect people uh, in a room, the people with the highest height will contribute very little to the total height of the collection. But if you collect people in a room, people with the highest income will completely dominate everybody else who has lower income. We know about this income inequality. So this is fat gate distribution. All right, so let's move a little further. So this fat tail actually has a name. It goes back to a Bible. Uh, you can read this. For everyone that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away that which he hath. So this is, uh, you know, this is a verse from uh, uh, Matthew, Matthew's Gospel in Bible. It's explaining this effect that, you know, uh, rich get richer, poor get poorer. <laughs> that's that's the world we're living in right now. And, it's, you know, there is radial income inequality. So income distribution is, is fat there. And we'll go to some reasons which kind of explain, you know, give uh, insight into one of the kind of basic principles which lead to these things. So the Matthew effect is catching it. That if you, if you have a million dollars, it's very easy to make the next million. But if you're poor, it's very difficult to even get by. So that's what's being done by this, right? And that's what we see. So the purpose of this talk is to kind of tell you, you know, but to kind of discuss that we see a lot of light tail distributions in some settings. But what people missed out was that this comes up a great deal as well, the fat tail distribution as well. 
particularly for catastrophic events, for outlier events, fat tails explain them much better, and they also tell you that one has to worry a great deal. So we have some people from RBI here who worry a lot about, you know, the, the portfolio of uh, uh, dollars, currencies, etc. that RBI has, and you know, fat tail events can be devastating. So one has to be extremely careful and what they All right. I, sh I should mention, you know, uh, one of the things I do, so when I showed you the cover of my life, it had a small hint to it, because I keep in touch with the industry. I don't, I'm not a big letter. I keep on going there. Last four my, my five months, I was with the Rajan gang. Not the Chota Rajan, but the Bada <laughs> Rajan, the Raghuram Rajan. Rajan. And, and so I got to kind of, you know, uh, deal with some, see some of this stuff happening in real life. And they have some very uh, fascinating problems that money should lie mathematics to solve. All right, so why do we model uncertainty? Right? Why do we model uncertainty? Let's just go to this slide. So you can see this slide. The average depth of a lake is 3 feet. And if you did model the uncertainty, if you assume that the actual depth was only 3 feet and went into the lake, the variability can kill you, literally. So, but, I mean, this is a kind of a, you know, illustrated example, but the point is you have to model uncertainty correctly. You know, the earthquake probability is 1 in 100 and not 1 in 10,000. There's a big difference in how you react to it. So I'll give you examples of these things as we go along. You know, my plan right now is, I'll, so I've explained to you, I've kind of illustrated to you what light tail distributions are, what fat tail distributions were. So I told you this early on, so in case you need to leave, you're in a hurry, you know, you've got the gist of the talk. But my plan now is, I'll tell you a little bit more about why we need to model uncertainty, what is probability, how is probability used to model uncertainty, and some kind of broad applications of probability. I can't cover many, but some interesting applications of probability. So I'll talk and then I'll come back and go to the underlying reasons behind the two distributions, why we see them so often. So that's the big plan. Okay, uh, so this is law of averages. And the point here is, you know, there is law of averages. So you know what a law of averages is? Can anyone have a sense of it? Uh, if I... Yeah, go ahead. Minimum, maximum and divided by two. Ah, okay. <laughs> so anybody else knows of this? With this kind of assume that everything is nice and uniform in between. Every number between minimum and maximum is equally likely. No. But it need not be. Need. Need not be. It's misleading. It's it that can be misleading, yes. But you think of a coin. Heads, I get one rupee, tails I get zero. What's my average income going to be if I keep on flipping the coin? Fifty percent. Fifty percent, right? So that's law of large numbers. Lots of random independent things, the average begins to look like one number. So if I flip a coin, say five hundred times, my income is on an average going to be 250 rupees with some deviation. But I also not assume that my income is exactly 250 rupees. That's the flaw of averages. So one still needs to keep randomness in, in perspective. So that's the point of this, you know. One cannot ignore randomness. Alright, now I'll give you a slightly more detailed example. This is kind of, you know, closer to my heart. It's about the queue at a bank. So the reason I got interested in probability in my undergraduate was because we used to work on cues. And you know, you talk to a lot of scientists, they tell you that they always knew what they wanted to do. When they were young, they looked at the stars and they wondered what was going on. And they, when they were young, they played with uh, you know, plants and they wondered you know, why the plants are coming the way they are. I was not like that at all. <laughs> stars didn't do that much for me, plants were fine. But uh, cues really bothered me. As I'm sure to many of us, you know, standing long time in a queue is, is a painful experience. So I, I, it bothers me, that gives me a lot of time to think about things and I think about how to model queuing. That's, uh, so let's try to see what goes on here. So suppose our interest is in estimating probability of waiting time exceeding half an hour. It's a very reasonable thing, right? You worry about waiting time, I'm not going to wait here for this long. So what do I need to know then? I need to know the arrival time patterns of customers and service time patterns of customers. And think of this from manager's point of view. You know, he's worried that if people wait for too long, then he's going to lose customers. So, arrival time patterns and service time patterns. So, suppose the information given to him is that, you know, arrival date is 6 per hour. On an average, every 10 minutes, a person is coming. And on an average, 
there will be 8 minutes a person is getting served. So this is kind of the average number. And the, is that enough? Is that really enough to you know, kind of understand what the probability of waiting time is more than half an hour is? Yeah. It is? Do you think it is? Yes. Anybody else? It is enough. Like Having these numbers. How many, how many people can get service at what time? Uh, so yes, we will not talk about that. So you need to know that, sure. Yeah. So you need to know, so we just know average, on an average 10 people are coming in, yeah, right? Yeah, 6 some people are coming in every 10 minutes, one person. And the average service time is 8, that's how many. Uh, so let's see, let's just take two examples. So scenario 1. So scenario 1 is everybody comes exactly after 10 minutes. Right? And everybody gets up exactly 8 minutes. But that's a lovely scenario for everybody, right? The manager is happy, the customers are happy. You want to get there, you know, if we had the kind of our mobile, we could tell people come at this time, exactly at that time, you know, we can, we can we try to reach this situation. But nonetheless, that's one scenario. There's another scenario where everybody comes, all the six people come, right in the beginning. And the first person has 48 minutes of service time and all the others have negligible amount of service time. So now you have 5 people who are waiting 48 minutes. Right? So probability is 5 by 6. 5 by 6 of uh, professional people are now waiting more than half an hour. While in this case nobody is waiting even 1 minute. So what's the, what do we need to do? You know, what's, what's missing? Spacing. We need to understand how people are inter-arrival times, how arrivals are spaced, how service times are distributed. So I'm just trying to say that if we knew the probability distribution, meaning, you know, we may not, we won't know when the next person is going to come to a bank. A manager would not know that. But suppose he had over time with up experience and he had probability distribution of it. So he knew, okay, what's the probability that uh, uh, a person will come between say 10 minutes and 12 minutes, or between 13 minutes and 20 minutes, so on and so forth. If you knew that information, and if you knew the information of service time, you know, how many, uh, what's the chance that somebody will get finished between 5 minutes and 7 minutes, 8 minutes and 10 minutes, then one can, then one has a proper model. With that model, one can play with and compute lots of things. So that's at least motivating how probability distributions help you get a grip of uncertainty. It's a simple example, but it's, you know, widely, widely used these kinds of things. So queuing theory, if you see, when you make call center phone calls, you have so many agents waiting, and when I say call center phone calls, I mean, from the US and all that and coming here. I have a question here. The first service should be zero minutes, right? If six people come at the same time, yeah. then the first service is the first guy gets the service that's immediately. Right. So why are we writing first service 48 minutes? The rest yeah. will be 48 minutes. Yeah, that's that, that's wrong. Yeah, that's a mistake. That's right. First that's service should be zero minutes. No, no, I don't five will be 48 minutes. No, what I mean is first person service time is 48 eight minutes. What you're saying is this waiting is zero. That is correct. Yeah. But the first time, is, excuse me, sir. Uh -huh. The first guy, if I'm six people are coming, yeah. and I'm the first one to walk in, I'll get a service in zero minutes. No, so your waiting will be zero. Yes. But you will stay there for 48 times. So by service, I mean that like how long are you going to be with the with the band killer? You said six minutes. So the service time is eight minutes. Sir. On average. Huh. So everybody else's service time is zero. Okay. All the other people so you are can, zero. You can wait up to 48 minutes. So I'm just saying that even these guys, if all the other five people have zero service times and one person has 48 minutes service time, average service time is still 8 minutes. I'm just trying to say that your average are misleading. They, they can be gay. So that's that's the point we made here. Uh, yeah. So one first person has the longest service time. He comes in and waits for 48 minutes. All the others have negligible amount of service time. But they have to wait behind this person. So that's a bit, that's the worst case scenario in this setting. That, that's the point we need us to Okay, so the point is, uh, yeah, so I'm saying that, you know, the applications of this are in call center, there's a queue when you make a phone call, it's a heavy queue and then people have to decide which call center agent gets assigned to you, they try to gauge what your requirements might be and match you to the right person. So now mathematics goes into these things. When you click on the internet, you know, your request goes, the packets of information go and they queue up a variety of places. And now queuing theory goes into modeling that, that kind of stuff. Certainly if you go to uh, you know, amusement parks, banks, etc., you see queues, so people uh, use this kind of queuing theory, you're not in that setting. Any other questions? Or? All right. 
So now, so I kind of, this was just to say, okay, why we need probability distributions and how they can, they can help us. It's a very simple example. One can talk about probability distribution of return on stock price, I might post this stock, how much return will I get over the next five days. It'll have some probability distribution. One can model these things. All right, so what is a probability distribution? Let's just talk a little bit more about this. So think of again rolling a dice. So what's the probability distribution of rolling a dice? One by six. Each outcome is one by six. And why is that the case? Because there are six alternatives. And they're equally likely, right? There's no reason to prefer one over the other. You know, there's nothing special in the dice that makes it same. Unless it was Chopin That's right. That's right, yeah. People load the dice anyway. So by the way, so if you get a chance, I didn't put this, uh, the cassette, uh, the video here, uh, just showing you the time. Percy Diaconis is a professor in Stanford. He was a magician before and then he became a common list. So you know magician. He can flip a coin, a normal coin, so it always lands here. Okay. It's, uh, well, he, he's, he's skilled. It's not, it's not like this. It's a little bit like this. But in Las Vegas yes. it happens a lot, sir. What's that? In Las Vegas, uh -huh. this thing goes on all the time. You mean rolling of a dice or all the other things? Anything. Sure, sure. sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Counting cars as well, right? That's uh, everything. The girls sure. are all green. What's that? The yeah. girls are green. I see. Because they hypnotize you. <laughs> okay, so the point is this. I mean, you could get philosophical about this, right? You, you could say that, okay, you know, if I knew everything about the dice, if I knew the weather conditions, pressure conditions, if I knew how the force was applied, then I know exactly what's going to happen to the dice. And then you can become a little bit more philosophical, like Laplace, he said in the early 1800s, that you know, if you tell me the forces which act upon other particles, tell me their positions and velocities, I can tell you how the future is going to evolve. He said something more, he said, I can tell you what happened in the past. Right. Uh, so that's a classical deterministic point. So that, but we know that that's not practically feasible. You'll never have this kind of information. In fact, modern science tells you that if you use each and every you know, part, elementary particle to do computation for you, that cannot compute and predict the future going forward. Modern science tells you a lot more about quantum physics and all that. I won't go into that. But let's, unless somebody feels strong, then we can just take the discussion up in question answer. But the point is, you know, practically it is not feasible. So really probability in some sense is a very kind of parsimonious and very pragmatic science. The pragmatically we say that okay, there is absolutely no reason for one side to have a preference over the other side. So we will assume they are equally likely and then we get the, the probability they are going to be. So again, we don't know what the outcome is going to be, but we know it's probability and probability is going to be same. Total probability has to be one. Event will, some event will happen for sure. But each event is equally likely, leave the probability one by six. Now the same rationale will work for any situation. For stock returns, you'll come with a probability distribution, saying, okay, what's the chance of seeing, you know, 2% change in one day or minus 2% change in one day, so things like this. Or for inter-arrival times, what's the chance of, you know, you cannot again predict when people come in a bank, but we can come up with a probability distribution of these things. So that's how we come up with probabilities. All right? So let's just play a small game just to get a sense of, you know, uh, I guess in some sense, I kind of say that, you know, I took to the probability because I always had some sense of risk. I worry a great deal, and I worry a great deal. I guess most people worry a great deal about future. Except if you have some cultural agenda, then you worry about the past as well. This is my colleague's note. Uh, okay, so let's do this uh, experiment. So you have a choice. You have to do one of these things. You can take a ride on a roller coaster. You can drive across Mumbai Pune Expressway one way. Or you can take a two hour long airplane flight. You have to do one of these things. And I guess your criteria is now risk perception. So joy, you can get it for a while, but risk perception. So give me a sense of how many of you think that the most risky thing is the roller coaster? Quite a few, right? Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, yeah. How many of you think that the most risky thing is the Mumbai Pune Expressway? <laughs> okay. Alright, so that's that's clear. A lot of people that think Mumbai Pune Expressway is risky. 
And uh, how many of you think, you think that airplane flight is risky? It's the most risky. So nobody thinks airplane flight is more risky. And that's interesting. I see. Um, and between, uh, let's say, airplane flight and... So, so I guess it's clear now that number one is Mumbai Pune Expressway, highest risk. Number two is roller coaster. And number three is two on uh, no, airplane flight. So let's look at the probabilities. So number one is indeed Mumbai Pune Express. I did this kind of rough calculation. If you do Google search, you find that 43,000 vehicles travel every day on Mumbai Pune Expressway. And then you have a sense of how many people die. So it's about one in a million. And for every ride that you do. Thereabouts. If you do, airplane statistics are by and large well known. The number that you hear out of this order, one in nine million, one in ten million, these are in good airlines. So if you're like me, you know what the good airlines are. You keep track of these things. Now, there are bad airlines too. Air India is not one of them. <laughs> Air India Express is. But uh, there the statistics becomes 1 in 900,000. So it's a factor of 10 billion. Uh, okay, and ride on roller coaster. So that's 1 in 300 million. And this is kind of overstating it. If you do a search, people say it's 1 in 700 billion. One in 1.5 billion. So roller coasters are extremely safe. Okay. Uh, so a little bit about myself. You know, when I'm riding in a plane and there's turbulence, and people, you know, my wife's been with me, uh, she can tell you how I have a tap running out of my palm. You know, I'm sweating so much. Uh, if, when I go inside, I look and uh, you know, look at the, uh, the pilot and see he's been okay, he's not been thinking or something like that. Uh, so I worry about these things. Uh, when I'm going to Mumbai Pune Expressway, now like, <laughs> you know, before we start, and then my son says, you know, Papa, put the gear on, let's get started. So it's, you know, I, I worry a great deal about how, how I'm going to go on Mumbai Pune Expressway. And roller coasters, I've always enjoyed, so I have a picture proof. Oh. Yeah. yeah, here we go. So, so that's actually me there. You can see I'm having fun, but if you see it closely, I'm actually reading a book as well. <laughs> it's right here. And, uh, oh, sorry, yeah. That's right. So yeah, these were before knowing the numbers. I kind of knew that when you're on a roller coaster, you don't have to worry. Everybody is taking care of things. You just kind of enjoy yourself. Yeah. All right. So now I'll tell you a few applications of uh, probability. Just very few. One can go on and on about these things. So let's take the first one. So this is dikes to avoid flooding. So dikes are kind of you raise up land to kind of guide the water so it doesn't flood. And then I'll talk about insurance. And I will not talk about finance option pricing. It's a little bit more elaborate. Later if we have time and if people are interested, I can go into that. So this is, you know, uh, this dike is from Netherlands. So in Netherlands, you know, the land, two-thirds of Netherlands is actually below sea level. And it's kind of surviving because of dikes around it and dams around it. So throughout the century, the coast has suffered numerous disaster floods. So 1953, for example, about 2,000 people died. 2,000 square kilometers of area was flooded. 200,000 people had to be evacuated. 100,000 people had to be evacuated. 200,000 cattle died. So massive floods. So they worry a great deal about these things. Uh, and they've actually put together a team of people, you know, experts of all sorts. This is called Delta Project. It's been going on for the past 30-40 years. To build dikes and dams and to know how high dikes, etc. should be so as to control the probability of flooding. And the probability of flooding that they're looking at in this Amsterdam vicinity area, and the probability of flooding in that area, is controlled to be 1 in 10,000 years. 1 flood in 10,000 years. So they have to compute how high the dike has to be. And the number came to be about 5 feet. 5 meter, 5.4 meter. And with global warming, the sea level is expected to rise, so this height is going to go up even further. So that's a big deal. Let's just see a picture of this. So this is what Netherlands would have been without the dikes. Without the dikes. This one. This is Amsterdam. So this is what it would have been, and this is what it is right now. So they have experts. I mean, you might ask, okay, why can't you know we have talked about coastal roads in Mumbai, we do reclamation and all uh, many times. Why can't we have experts who understand these things, help us in 
you know, doing things appropriately. So anyway, so this is one application. So the modelers kind of worry about perfect storm happening, you know. There's a storm, there's a high tide, winds are heavy, all of these things happen, then how high will the sea tides be? And that's, you know, you have to have a mathematical model of that that requires probability distributions, and that's used to come up with this decision, you know, come up with the right height to control these probabilities to one in 10,000. Now they also worry about river flooding, and that's a much less worry because when river floods, the, it doesn't destroy the soil. While ocean flooding with salt water destroys the soil. So there the probabilities are one in thousand at that level. So that's how they impish. Very little analysis goes into this. Because raising dike size is very expensive. So one has to be careful about, you know, you cannot afford to make it too high, but you cannot afford to have uh, flooding either. Alright, so let's do one more example. So I started off. Sir, with that this. kind of dike height, how do you see the sea? With that kind of a height of five meters. How do you get a view of the sea? Uh, you don't, right? I mean, this is the picture so, here. So you miss the sea, right? So I should have illustrated it here. So if you are here, you don't see the sea. You see nice grass here. Oh, I see. And then you come here. Okay. And it's layers of dikes. You know, so one dike initially takes care of some uh, storm, and then next dike and next dike. So it's kind of nicely done. Layers. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so any questions on this? Uh, <laughs> Insurance business, so fire insurance, home insurance, life insurance, car insurance, so many things. Uh, so they worry a great deal about probability. And the business is that, okay, you have a large customer base, premium is trickling in, this is nicely premium trickling in, so by large people don't really worry about premium being modeled. You know, it's, going, it's more or less realistic, not too much randomness there, but they worry about large claims, and claims can actually be fat claims. So an earthquake comes in, the damage can completely buy out an insurance company. Extremely common, you have examples of companies which kind of thrived for 20, 30 years, everybody got bonus year after year, and then company got completely wiped out. By just one big event, one extreme event. So they worry a great deal about uh, factor distributions, and worry in the sense that you know, they keep that in mind by deciding what the premium they should charge, and how much water should they keep in the bucket. So this is regulation by the government. You know, government says, you're running a business, okay, on an average, you may think that the premium is coming in more than on an average what you're losing out in claims, but you worry about one big claim wiping out, out the compete well, so government says you have to keep some amount of reserves with us. So each insurance company will keep some amount of reserves with us, and how much is appropriate, and how much gives what kind of security. So probability comes up here, probability to guard against extreme catastrophic deterrence. And then, it's not just for insurance. You have a thriving reinsurance companies, reinsurance uh, industry, which insures insurance companies. So insurance companies sell their, their layers of risk to reinsurance companies, and then they worry about these tail properties. I mean, they, you go to that, they are talking about 0.1% probabilities, 1% probability, these kind of things. So right? why are such events factored? Why are such events factored? Uh, so I'll give some illustration as to why fight factors are currently. But uh, the big picture is that, you know, what you're worried about is maximum of the wave size. Right? In a one year, what's the maximum wave size? Now, there's a probabilistic law, just like central linear theorem, that maximum under fairly general conditions are factored. So that's, you know, it's just because it's a maximum of many things, that tends to be factored. I'll come back to this topic later on as well. Any other questions? Uh, Right. So this, let me you know this is an option, it's called swap and swap option. Only thing I want, want to point out to you is that, you know, when you talk about financial markets, you talk about serious money, so it's 381 trillion dollars here. So that's the market size of these things. But it's a little complicated. If you wish, I can come back to this later on. Is this the world here. size? What's that? Is this the world size? That's right, yeah. yeah. World size. World size, yeah. Primarily all the action is either in New York or London. No. Oh. But it is the world size. All right. So now, so so we, I introduce you some you know uh, factors, distributions, like the bell curve earlier on. Then I told you why we need to model uncertainty, and how we model uncertainty using probability distributions. And I give you some applications of probability. Now I can give you some more applications very quick. You know, when you talk on your cell phone, 
or when you talk on the phone or when you send messages on the internet, suppose you say hello. Now hello will be encoded into a sequence of letters, 0, 1, 0, and that's how that code is going to go. But then you worry that this code is going to get corrupted by noise. In wireless setting, you know, the weather is bad. This 0, 1, 0 becomes 0, 1, 1. These corruptions can happen with some probability. The easiest thing is you don't send 1, 0, 1, 0, you send 5 copies of it. And then what you get over there, you take, take a majority. You know, if you get 3 which are 0, 1, 0 and 2 which are different, you take okay, the answer is 0, 1, 0. So again, probabilistic analysis is very kind of fundamental to everything that we do. All of communication, when you make rockets, each component, you can't make components to infinite accuracy. How much accuracy should you build them to? How much error you should tolerate? Probability is intrinsic to all these things. And uh, certainly the bell curve is very important in that setting. Now what I'll do is, I'll tell you about how bell curve arises in practice. And big picture is, if you have some of independent randomness, it begins to look like a bell curve. And what I mean by that is, Let's look at this picture here, just uh, follow me on this. So the first picture is probability function for rolling a dice. So six outcomes, one, two, three, four, five, six, each has probability one by six, right? The second picture is now when I'm rolling two dice. So what happens when I roll two dice? What are the possible outcomes that I can see? One by six. No, what are the numbers? So, okay. When I roll two dice and sum the numbers, what do I say? Two, uh, two, 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 twelve. Two, two, twelve, right? So sum we can be two. What's the probability of seeing two? One by six. Two. So that's one on one dice, one on the other dice. One by thirty-six. One by thirty-six. And what's the probability of seeing twelve? One by twelve. Same, same. Okay. And uh, which one is most likely when you look at the sum? Equal. They're all equal? Yes. Uh, that's a mistake that historically was made. What's that? Seven. 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 And why is that? Because it's six on one. Six. And there are many combinations. So what are the combinations? Uh, six, one, five, two, three, four. So what he's saying is? Uh, add, add. You have to add all these things up. So six, one, and one, six. That's two combinations. Four, three, and three, four. That's another two combinations. So what's the probability? Uh, that's going to be, I guess, uh, 6 upon 36, right? 6 by 30, 1 by 6. 1 by 6, yes. 1 by 6. Okay. Yeah. That's what you get here. That's this picture here. And uh, for getting a 6, you have less combinations. For getting a 5, you have less combinations. So you get already from 1 to 2. So I'm looking at just one roll of dice. Basically, I'm looking at two rolls of dice and summing it up. I begin to see something which looks like a triangle. Right? Now by the time you do 5, you have something which looks like a bell curve already. And this is true very generally. I could have started with a very funny distribution here. It could be anything. If I keep summing it, the central portion keeps on getting more mass. The tails become lighter and lighter and you get something which looks like this. So that's the big principle uh, that you know, is kind of a law of nature. Because in law in nature, we see a lot of things because of sums of lots of randomness. The more the randomness, the closer you get to Gaussian distribution. That's an important point. Then you know, this picture becomes more and more defined and more and more like this as we take more and more sums. So it's a law of nature that we have lots of things which are independently coming together. Uh, yeah. And they're not very variable. That's other condition. Yeah, this is not that variable. If you have something extremely variable, things become a little bit different. So the second example is of two dice, is it? Two dice. N equal to two. And third is three dice. N equal to three. So why is it more uniformly distributed? Uh, what do you mean? The when, when you have more number of dice, I yes. see the curve becoming broader. Why? Why? Is yeah, it's becoming more like bell curve here. Why, why is that? When that's, event, a, that's a calculation. When the events go higher. That's right. So that's it averages, you mean? Uh, yeah, it, I mean, they're more, you know, you're counting the number of ways in which this can happen. Ah, right. And you're counting the number of ways in which this can happen. This has many more scenarios. Much more probability. Yeah, much more probability compared to this. And this process continues when you go to 4 and 5 and uh, so on. So you have more alternatives, that's what you're saying. That's right. That's right. Let me show you a video in a moment. That, uh, this, uh, but that's exactly right. More alternatives means I got it. probability in the middle. I got it, yeah. 
Uh, but yes, yeah, so this is how things work out for dice, and that's kind of a law of nature because you do see a lot of independence coming together to give you an output, to give you something random, then that random will look like a Gaussian distribution. Uh, so is it what nature has designed for all of us to be same? Uh, I mean, so human intelligence, is, I am told, is a natural bell shape curve, human intelligence. That's what IQ is bell shape. Nature has designed us to be unbiased, is it? So nature has, you know, many of these things, like our height is natural bell curve, yeah. our shoe size is bell curve, intelligence. our intelligence is bell curve, our chest size is a bell curve. So, you know, very difficult to see somebody with 56 inches of chest. But so why wealth is not bell curve? You see somebody like that, you give him a high position. Wealth, wealth. wealth is not like that. Yeah. So I'm exactly, these are exactly the point I'm trying to address. So the way to think about this is that in our body, these mechanisms, this height, etc., are coming because of our independent factors like interacting. You know, your nutrition that you had, maybe nutrition that your ancestors had, all of that is adding up. There's variability, but it's adding up, and that's why you see a Gaussian distribution. While the answer to the wealth question is that you know, wealth becomes large because of a feedback effect. The more you have, the more you get more. The less you have, the less, you know, the less likely you have. That's depending on the current system. That's right, that's right. If you change the current system, then it may not be that. That's right, it was not the case in Soviet uh, Union. What do you mean? Or perhaps it's still one case in Soviet. Is that right? Stalin was much more wealthy than everyone. But that would fit in the normal distribution. Stalin was a delegate. He would call it normal. But that would be the outlier. That's different from having a fact that would be... You still have practice as living in Soviet system. So, yeah, so it may well be true. We have to look at the data. That's also influenced by policy, isn't it? What's that? The way income is redistributed. Yeah. It's also influenced by that. It's not just. No, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the whole point. Yeah, that's why the system, the system is set up. So, this is exactly right. You to see fat tail in income distribution, and then it says that you know, this is wrong, inequality is wrong, and one needs to change policies, tax people, to make things better. I mean, that's absolutely right. But in France, it failed, sir. Taxation failed, right? If France is more equal than, say, UK, right? Is it? Yeah. 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 Or US. No, US definitely. Yeah. What, what examples can you give where the bell curve becomes flatter and you have more of fat things? So, what I didn't talk about was that... Your uh, blood composition. Hmm? Your blood composition basically is a fat tail. Blood composition? Yes. So, your platelets can, on average, uh, your platelets can like grow out of bound if you have something like right. polycythemia. Right. I see. I see. So diseases. Not, diseases. Not, um, everything is like mediocre sound kind of thing. Our body weight is not <laughs> blood. black swan. Nothing <laughs> done. That's the. Right. Sir, I, I think uh, I have a sense that events which are risk averse are tend to be fat tail. Is that true? No, I, I, so like, uh, I think that the intuition again is that they feed back upon themselves. You know, if it's going well, then it goes further up. That's kind of the right intuition to take. Or it's a maximum of many, many things. Or it's a product, you know, we talk about sums being uh, light paid, being bell curve. If you had a product, like in finance, when your returns become a product, that's those things. Those are the things we do. Have a feedback loop, you're saying, and they'll become fat paid, right? But they, it's just because it's a product of random things, not a sum of random things. Product, okay. product, multiplication. Yeah. So again, if something is large, it can become much larger, higher probability becomes very large. Uh, I should tell you that uh, you know. So again, to understand practically, when one sees normal curve, there are things. So again, going back to the book reference that you have. So Barber's income would be Gaussian distributed, light day. Dentist income would be light day. Not in South Mumbai, by the way. So. You know, most of what I have in my mouth is because of our <laughs> South Mumbai dentist. And most of what he has in his house is because of you know, my family. <laughs> but yeah, so then the point that I'm making is that the dentist's income, this is that, you know, it's a function, it requires labor. So there's only so much labor time that's available to you. So that makes it kind of like there. But in fact, it's scalable. You know, if you write, so let me give you a few more examples of fat days. Uh, if you write a book, you know, how many books are sold? Mostly few books are sold by authors. And then some become bestsellers, massive amount of books are sold. Now because there's no labor involved in this. You've just written one book, now it's just a matter of you know how popular it gets. 
movie sales, you know, movie viewership. That's another example of something you have there. So, uh, a probably better way to explain it would be if you go back to the dice, uh, the dice diagram and uh, based on the, uh, let's say, n is equal to 2 events, yeah. you bias the n is equal to 3 events. So, then probably when you go towards higher, uh, I mean, n, higher ends, then you will see a fat tail distribution. Because right now everything is independent, right? Yeah, yeah. But if you bias the events in the next die, roll of die, uh -huh. then you might see. So, this is what happens in real life. So, if let's say right now my income increases, but in the next uh, uh, period of time, my, I am more likely to get a li higher in, uh, income than the other guy. Yeah. So, things get biased and then you don't see a natural event that's happening. Right, that's right, yeah. yeah. So, that's exactly, but I have a kind of nice picture for that later. So, it's exactly the illustrative Any other questions? Uh, okay, uh, so let me show you this video. Now, this video does a much better job of saying something that I've been trying to say. I not make it work here, but it should work here. Right, so this uh, is a galloping ball, uh, because the first person to make one of these and uh, name it after himself was called uh, galloping. And what you do, you take the ball, you drop it into the top, and it bounces off all these nails before eventually going into one of these categories. Uh, and when the ball hits each nail, in theory, there's a 50-50 chance of it going left or right. So each path is pretty much unpredictable. If I was to take uh, two balls and put them in, and even if I try to put them exactly the same, they will end up in completely different positions. We cannot accurately predict where any given ball will go. However, we can make a few statements. We can say that a ball uh, is more likely to end up than in the middle than the edge. Because the center categories, there are lots of different paths that end up here. There are only a few paths that end up on the edge. So what we can do is take this piece of scientific equipment, uh, attach it to the top, and start putting these in by the handle. If we put in absolutely loads of these balls, even though each individual one, we couldn't accurately predict where it's going to end up, we can accurately predict the overall pattern from lots of them. Right, and that pattern we end up with is called uh, the normal distribution. In fact, I've got a few too many in the middle there. Uh, now, a lot of things in nature follow this pattern. Uh, if you measure people's height, they will follow a normal distribution. Shoe sizes are a lot of things in science and uh, engineering and maths match this kind of bell-shaped curve. Uh, in fact, uh, those of you, if you've done A-level maths, you will know that because the ball has choices of going left or right on each one, this is actually a binomial distribution. You have lots and lots of balls going down, as you get more and more of them, it gets closer and closer to exactly matching the normal distribution. So there you are. In probability, you can't predict the exact location one ball will end up, but you can say a lot about what will happen across the mini ball. So this lottery system of America is highly flawed from this angle. Yes. The lottery system of America is highly flawed uh -huh. because you have only one chance and the okay. ball may go to the right. Okay. So all the guys, 90% of the left will be just chucked out, you know. Uh -huh. It's not a random, you know, absolutely random. The way they did the $1.5 billion at Los Angeles Street yes. yeah. yeah. you know, they showed the ball. Uh -huh. The ball was not going in a pure, because it should follow a pure random uh, sure. phenomenon. Sure. It was following a skew because he, he sort of reduced, diluted the skew by putting it in a wire funnel, you know? Yeah, yeah. And he overcame the skew. Okay. Skew meaning it can be right-handed or left-handed. So, yeah. Uh, okay, so I, I can't, so what you're saying is that the way they're throwing things is biased. Yeah. So, some things are more likely than the other, so yeah. it's not being fair. It's not, it's it's not, not being fair. It should be random. Sure. And we should file a suit. <laughs> If you win, then you know. Sure, sure. May I just point out something? Yes. I suspect that this model, I don't know if I'm right, but I suspect that this model has got something to do with Nikola Tesla's model of uh, Earth's energy. The design seems to be similar. Okay. Has it been an optic? Are you aware of the design of Nikola Te Te Tesla? I actually am not. I, I don't know if anybody else is aware of this. Go ahead, man. What's it? So, do you remember Nikola, Nikola yeah, Tesla's yeah, yeah. design? Yeah, so he had two uh, huge 
things, one on top of the other. So this uh, is a garden board, board uh, because the first person to make one of these this and uh, name it after themselves so is called uh, Galvin. Okay. And what you do is you pull it into the top and it bounces off all these nails or eventually. Summing up those things. So it's a sum of noise. And hence it looks like a Gaussian, uh, like a bell curve. I call it Gaussian distribution, but I mean a bell curve. But the key was randomness, right? It yes. Introduce, introduce pure randomness. And that's the essence, isn't it? No, the key is sum of randomness. Yeah, but first of all, the event has to be random to be. That's right, that's right. So that, of course, so is what there. that gadget did was to introduce randomness. Because whenever you hit a nail, you're equally likely to go this side or that side. So that's a randomness. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you can see. So, this is Francis Galton, amateur mathematician. So, he did quite a few things. You know, amateur is kind of saying that he's not Gauss or he's not uh, Pascal. Uh, and he's Charles Darwin's first cousin. And this is his comment on the bell curve, or what I call the Gaussian distribution. So, you can see this law of frequency of error range with serenity and incomplete self effacement amidst the widest confusion. The huger the mob, the more perfect in its way. So more the noise you have, more terms you have. You know, you think that more terms means more noisiness, difficult to manage, not computation. But better the approximation, better the closer it is to Gaussian distribution, to the bell curve. So that's the beauty of it. It's supreme law of unreason. Because it's very unreasonable, right? More noise, more you know. More the uncertainty, more the actual uns the more actual certainty. Yeah? So this is the reason in the madness. That's right, yeah. yeah. This complete random observation, it's always fascinated me that the, a lot of writing from around this period, the uh -huh. scientists, they just write poetically about, about the scientists. That seems to have gone on the I science side. Right? I was reading some of the mental stuff also. It's again, very poetically written about the science. So this, you should read uh, Nassim Talib. Yeah? It's not poem, but it's outlandish. It's just, I mean, the, his ego, the sense of what happens, not right. just the mathematical. The choice of yeah. supporting behind it. That's right, yes. Yeah. So the way the universe has evolved, purely follows this. The way the universe has evolved, it started so chaotically with the Big Bang. That's right. And look at the uniformity in the universe. It's sure. mind-boggling. Sure. This absolutely confirms to us. So there's something there, yeah. And there is noise and it's kind of... So it's a group of chaos theory, isn't it? It looks like chaos and then actually there is something over there which is... Uh, so chaos is that you know you perturb the initial condition tinyly, a butterfly flaps and suddenly she earthquake in Japan. Yeah. So that's true. So it kind of looks like noise, but it's actually yeah. yeah. Also, it has those things like strange attackers. Yeah. There is something which it returns to. So it looks chaotic, but actually there is something in the center, so to speak, which is running the show. That's right. So it's not completely chaotic. That's right. So I should say one more thing. You know, when you look at this wall and you kind of ask scientists what's going on, they tell you that inside the atoms there's a lot of motion going on. Even in the reality that we see there's a lot of motion going on, but in aggregate it's a stationary wall. So even at this level we see, you know, noise becoming, showing you order. So, but why did this not happen in Arab Springs? <laughs> <laughs> I'll show you a fat tail diagram again. Let's discuss this kind of fat tail diagram. It's a serious question. Let's, let's talk about the fat tail diagram. That's more like it, right? Yeah, yeah. Can you explain how the atoms are vibrating? They know that every atom is vibrating fully. How is it that it appears to be real and steady? 
time scale that is, right? It's as simple as that. You know, David Icke has researched into this, mm -hmm. and he suspects, and he has come to the conclusion that our reality is being completely manipulated by artificial intelligence, ETs out of space. <laughs> and he is saying the model you've drawn is very interesting. Okay. Because Nikola, Nikola, Nikola Tesla yeah. researched and he got Earth's free energy and he lit a whole city just by engineering his design. Yeah. And this, this gentleman is, is a cousin of Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin was probably a member of the Illuminati. And the Illuminati specialize in the theory of chaos. Okay. They love to create chaos. That is what is happening in India at the moment. We are very much under the influence of the Illuminati and they love the chaos theory. Okay. So what you are doing is basically talking Illuminati. Absolutely right. <laughs> okay, so so, okay, now, so have you, did the jits come back to you? Did it just go anywhere? Oh, so you have results. So, the sort of point is to see, okay, now, suppose we have, you know, 20 people in the room. What's the chance that two people have the same birthday? Does anyone want to hazard a guess? About 20%. About 20%. 0.5. That's pretty high, isn't it? I know it's 25 or 24. So you have no idea. It's 80%. It's 80%. 20 people, right? 20 people. 20 people. 20 people. Yeah. And no means enough. Yeah, share. That's right. Choose the year or the date? The date. The date. So it's like 9th of March, by the two different years. That's right. So does anybody have 15th January as a birthday? You can sing a song. <laughs> uh, all right. So, how many do you have? Any commonalities? Or? So, two people do have a common birthday. This audience. What's the size of the audience? So, forty-five percent. So, forty-two. So 42 people have given the ditch back. That must be the size of the audience. Maybe. <laughs> so February 23rd is uh, two people have a birthday. Two people. Have. So who are the people there? February 23rd? Ah, ah. Yeah. <laughs> that's right, that's right. That's right. <laughs> and I'm at 13. Huh? I'm at 13. So how are they together? 23rd, 23rd, 13. Ah. <laughs> How are they together? Yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> okay, they they, 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 they planned it, there, yes. <laughs> so the probabilities are as follows. I mean, the point is this. So, you know, how will you compute probability of something like this? So we'll assume that everyone has equal chance of taking any value from 1 to 365. Right? Now, whether it's a good assumption or not, okay, we won't discuss that. But let's just assume that everybody has equal chance of uh, taking any one of these days. And then you assume that all of us are doing it independently. So I don't know. <laughs> so, you know the, my birthday in no way affects what he reports. Okay. So with this number, so with these assumptions, one can do this computation. So if there were 10 people in the room, probability of two people having birthdays common would have been about 12%. At around 23 people, you get to the level of 50, of 15%. Uh, and it's almost of a certainty, so we had how many people? 42, right? 42, yeah. Yeah, so very likely. So 90%. It would have been an odd event if this had not happened. So we kind of expected this. Can you explain this? How it happens? Well, the calculation I told you is a very simple one. I'll just assume that each person is equally likely to be born on day 1, 2, up to 365. So each day has a probability 1 by 365. And what day is your birthday and what is my birthday are completely independent of each other. And now I'll just sum up the life, all the, you know, I'll count favorable events divided by total number of events. Right? Each event is equally likely. I'm picking one day, you picking another day, somebody else picking another day. So total number of combinations is the denominator. Favorable combinations where two people have common birthdays, at least two people have common birthdays, is the numerator. So, so the brief answer, my common sense I can answer without going into calculation, the probability is equal for everybody. If it is any number divided by 365, sir, what is the problem? 
that's what we are looking for. Excuse me sir, yeah. my, uh, sorry for my interruption. What I am saying is, I am born on a particular day yeah. and you are born on another day. Yes. So the probabilities of both of us being born on a particular day is equal. Yeah. So that is natural. So but on same day. On the, not on the same day, on my day sir. So what was the hypothesis? I no, you are talking about individual probabilities. One yeah. is right. Yeah. He yeah. is talking about two people having the same birthday, joint given. You and I have the same birthday. So you act like <coughs> So like suppose in amongst two of you, yes. what are favorable scenarios? He is on January first and you are on January first. Mm -hmm. That's probability one upon three sixty five squared. Plus oh, yes, he is on second, you are on second. Mm -hmm. So you know so on and so forth. So your probability of Two of you having common birthday is 1 upon 365 if you do the summing out. Right. If you will have some day and his having that day is 1 upon 365. Right. So and then you generalize for so many people. For 42 people, you do the calculation. So is it a product or it's a product? It's a, it's a, it's a product. It should be a product. I think it starts by saying that assuming that no one has the same uh, birthday. Yeah. And then if no one has the same birthday, then uh, I start with 1 by 365. I start with 1. The next person must be. 364 by 365 because he can't have a birthday which is equal to mine. Yeah. And the next person is sure. 364 by 365. And then he reached the 30th term, 24th term, he goes to point first. That's right. Oh, that is enough. Yeah, so you count that the probability it doesn't happen, and that's a product, and that's how you get it. One minus product. That's right. Okay, uh, so you guys are, let's just carry on. How are we doing on time? We probably have a close up soon, right? Yeah. So we'll close up in five minutes. Uh, so some observations. Now, you know, this bell curve that I've been talking about, that seems to be everywhere. Now, in 1900, Bachelier was a mathematician, again, a French mathematician. He used that to model financial markets in France. That work got completely hidden for about 50 years. And then somebody got the thesis, his thesis translated to English. And then, you know, using bell curve kind of distribution to explain financial markets, etc., became the orthodox. A lot of research happened from 50s and 60s using bell curve model of financial markets. And the returns that we see on any particular stock has a normal distribution, the bell curve distribution. So that became an orthodoxy. In 1962, Mendel brought, he's the person who invented the fractal geometry, but we won't talk about that in the next five, ten minutes. Now, he went to give a talk, he was at IBM, he went to give a talk at Harvard about his work. He was working on income inequality. He noted that income inequality has these factors. And he went to this professor's office and he found the same curve that he himself was playing with for so long. And he was completely surprised at how does this guy have the same curve that I have. And then that professor told him that he was working on cotton prices, on changes in cotton prices. So that's how a discovery was made. And Mandel Broad could find cotton prices. You know, the biggest part in this actual research, not just mathematical research, is getting clean data. It's an enormously difficult task. Uh, so he was able to get the clean data for cotton prices, but that was available at exchanges. For other things, you know, this was a time when computers were not very prevalent. So he collected that data and he found that cotton prices, if they were, so this time talking about changes in cotton prices in uh, any period, if they were normally distributed, if they were bell curve distributed, they looked like this. So I've tried plotting many of these distributions. Every distribution is from under bell curve. So it could be above or below. But it's not too noisy. But what he found was this. What he found was lots of huge movements. So what he found was that these cotton prices changes are actually factored. This was 1962. He gave a talk everywhere. There's a lot of excitement. But people didn't like it one bit. You know, they could do a lot with Gaussian distribution. They were doing a lot with Gaussian distribution. Gaussian, I mean, again, so, here, so he faced a great deal of resistance. It kind of died down. You know, these things happen a lot inside. And then, 1987, there was a market crash. You know, in one day, October 17, 1987, 23% market went down in the U.S. Thereafter, people started paying attention to this kind of work. And now there's a lot of, you know, work, research work which exploits the fact that returns not just on cotton prices, but really anything in the financial market. It's very factored. So that's how kind of fact it became, you know, it came into popularity. What do you attribute these noises to? So there's a herd effect, right? There's a feedback effect there. again. Sorry? There's a feedback effect. You see other people a selling. Herd, a herd effect. Herd effect, yeah. So you also sell. You see other people buying, you get paid, you also buy. So it's again it's a 
feeding upon itself. It's not independent. I've been following agriculture prices and I agree with this. Because in agriculture, the whole thing which distorts the price is the herd effect. That's right. For example, if farmers plant onions today and yeah. the prices go up, next year everybody will plant onions and the prices crash. I see. This is a herd mentality. That's right. That's That's right. right. This, in agriculture. this is long term memory as well. Yes. What happens in one year affects the second year. That's right. So, Mendel Brock didn't stop at this. He noticed that cotton prices have this long term memory. And then he generalized this idea, and that's how this geometry of fractals came about. No, but anyway, that's why I just want to make that comment. Uh, let me just show you something now. The facial attachment model. So now I just want to demonstrate how these fractals come up naturally. To a very simple natural model in the network setting. The model is kind of like a Facebook model. You have two friends who are talking to each other, and now friends will come sequentially. So the next friend comes, the next person will come sequentially, people will come sequentially. And a person comes in and looks at all the people who are already in the room, or in the room. And he or she will attach himself to a node which has to a person who has more friends. So, so I, I'm a stranger, I come to this town, I see the popular person, I want to attach myself much more to that person. Yeah. So I give preference to that. Specifically, I give higher probability to that. You know, people have a person having three friends. The probability to that being proportional to 3, there will be somebody who has 7 friends. The person with 7 friends will get more probability. So I distribute my probability like this. So this is a professional attachment model. So if somebody is doing well, chances of that person getting a new friend is much higher. If somebody is doing poorly, he's been left out, he'll continue to get left out. So this is a, so is this model clear? Professional attachment What is the science behind it, sir? Uh, this is, I'm saying, suppose this is how the body was. It's behavior. Yeah, suppose this is how the body was. Uh, it's a simple model. You know, it's trying to capture this feedback effect. But the big question is, in this simple setting, and under these simple assumptions, what is the world that we result? That's the question being asked. People are coming like this. What is the end result of people coming like this? How does you know how does the big picture look like? So let me see if I can get that to work. I think we have to go out. Should have it so this is, uh, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. So you see two nodes are connected to each other, they have a link, so that means they are friends. Now I'll write this code here, so I'll say go, and I'll store this down a little bit. The point was, this went a little fast, but the nodes were coming in and attaching themselves. If somebody has more friends, Speed. Let's just keep it at normal speed. So you can see how the graph is going. Think of this as Facebook graph going. Uh, now there's somebody popular. That person will keep on going more. If you can see the highest degree is 48, 49. This person is the highest number of friends. This is a degree distribution. Most people just have one link. About 235 years as you can see here. Some person has 64 links. Let me just speed this up a little bit. Let's just see what this looks like. So, so now this is showing the size of the node is showing how many friends you have. You can see that some people are now dominating the game. They're the very rich ones. And most people are very poor. So this is just kind of simply capturing. I mean this is a simple model, it's a toy model, but the intent is to explain a phenomenon that we see in their lives. So it looks fractal in nature. Is that? Yeah. It's fractal in nature. It looks fractal in nature as well. So that means no matter how smaller scale that you look at the picture, or how much further back you look at the picture, it looks the same. That's right. Okay, so that's uh, the point I want to make here. Uh, let's just take the interest of time to just talk here now. So this is an explanation for how fat is. And this, the feedback of it. It's one explanation and probably the most uh, pleasing one. So I'll just summarize now. So just summarizing, so there's my randomness and then there's my randomness. You know, in Belkov there's my randomness, in fact there's this my randomness. In Belkov winner is small compared to rest. Winners are actually. In fact winners dominate the rest. 
high weight, IQ, income of barber, dentist, so all the examples of high-grade distributions. Income, wealth, book sales per author, size of cities, that's also factored. If you see a popular city, everybody wants to go there. Uh, damage by earthquakes, use of words in vocabulary. Right. Because you know, a few words are popular, and then because they're popular, you are, you are more likely to use them again. You become comfortable with them. So again, there's a feedback effect. And if somebody else is using it, then you also start using that word. So that's feedback effect is here. Maximum height of waves, that has to be factored. So there's one interesting uh, observation in this. In both the situations, the degree of randomness is the same. So why the outcome is different? The input is same. So, so what do you mean by degree of randomness is the same? See, oh, I'm sorry, that is wild. I heard yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, Because it is wild. Yeah, yeah. This is just stating the point. Yeah. Uh, can I go on some more? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I just wanted to give you one anecdote. It's a pleasing anecdote between the people we had. This is uh, so Henry Poincaré is, is a famous mathematician. He's kind of the last of universal mathematicians who knew everything that was going on in his time. All the subjects he had was excellent. So this is a story, and you can see that you know he's he's a lot the guy to be battled with. You can see his picture. He's a good guy. Uh, so every day Poincaré bought bread from a baker. He was supposed to get one kg of bread and he actually recorded the weight of the bread that he got and he made a record of this and after some time when he looked at the plot he realized that he was actually getting on an average 950 grams of bread. So he called the police, now this is a little bit of an exaggeration but he got to punish the, uh, the, the baker, he was penalized and the, then the baker changed his behavior but Poincaré continued to plot the size of the bread loaf that he was getting. And this time he found out that he's actually getting more than one kg, but he still figured out that the baker is uh, cheating. So let me just explain to you how that happened. So this is a plot of what he saw in the first year before the baker was coming, and it kind of looks gorgeous. You know, on average it's 950 grams, sometimes it's higher, sometimes it's lower, but the average is 950 grams. And now, let's see what happens in the next time period. In the next time period, he plotted these things and he got this curve. All the points are beyond 1 kg like this. What would you conclude? What do you think is going on? Manipulated. Manipulated, yes, but how? He's changed the scale. He's no, changed the scale. He's making more of less than 950. He's making more of less than 950, okay? <laughs> But he's just choosing the big one and giving it to That's right, that's right, that's right. He's still making 950 gram on average, but when he's, whatever, whatever is a big piece, he gives it to point better. Because you can't, a natural distribution cannot look like this. This looks like a truncation of the previous distribution. So manipulated. That's right, yeah. So, <laughs> he's getting a truncated portion of this. So, socks can be manipulated like this, right? Yeah. Sure, sure. Not that it's So, now I know. Alright, so before I end, let me just say one thing about, you know, how research ideas come, you know, this, we should talk a little bit about. Sorry. So my research kind of focuses on aspects of rare events, you know, we build probability models, uh, we talk, limit, we say, you know, probability models are very complicated, but if you kind of, just like when we said, when we're summing up things, lots of sums have a very nice structure. So similarly, you look at models in some kind of limiting regime, and then you see a structure. So one does that kind of mathematics. So there's no mathematics in all these kinds of things, uh, kind of things. but how do the uh, research ideas come? You know, the point is you need to develop a great deal of background, a lot of mathematical sophistication. You need to be completely absorbed with the problem and just think about the problem. So let me just illustrate what the process really means. And so I don't know if you've seen this, some of you, if you understand what this word really means. <laughs> So you get the picture that you know, 
inspiration starts coming to you after you've done hard work, suddenly picture doesn't make sense, you can see the complete picture from the noise that you had earlier, everything connects. And it's beautiful, you know, you feel wonderful that you finally understood something. You know, it's like art coming through. And then you wake up the next day and realize that you know you had one bit too many and you you know all your assumptions were wrong and you're just fooling yourself in a silly high the whole time. And then this process gets repeated many, many times. That's that's the search for me. Alright, uh, so that's it. So some popular references. Uh, Against the Gods, the remarkable story of risk by Peter Bernstein. So I hope Kitab Khanna would you know, please appreciate this part. We took a little bit extra time here, but we are and that is the books that I got from here. Uh, the misbehavior of markets, that's a factor view of risk uh, by Benoit Mandelot that I mentioned earlier. Black Swan that you read uh, by Nassim Taleb, Impact of the Highly Coupling Problem. And then these are more technical books. One of the biggest management. Thank you very much.